Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be looking at orbital diagrams. So if you've been following along in your notes and in class, then you should be aware of the fact that uh, the orbitals that we've been looking at are a little complicated and that they have different energy levels and those energy levels have, you know, kind of a number and a letter associated with them. And, you know, S orbitals can hold two, P orbitals can hold six, stuff like that. So if you don't know any of that, you should probably go back and to look over your notes. Now, in an orbital diagram, the first thing that we need to be aware of is that we use boxes to represent the locations of electrons. So these are just an assortment of boxes, and it's way easier to draw than to draw one of those weird little shapes. Um, now, the other thing are that to represent electrons, we use arrows, and specifically, it's up arrows and down arrows. We don't use diagonals. We don't use left and right. It's always up or down. And there are three kind of basics that you need to know before we even start going over the rules. The first is that every box can only hold two electrons. That's just a rule, okay? So each box can only hold two. The boxes are labeled from lowest to highest energy. And so again, if you're thinking, what does that mean? Well, there was that pattern that we looked at, 1s, 2s, you know, uh, 2p, 3s, uh, stuff like that. And so that's kind of what you see here, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, etc. okay? So the lowest energy would be this right now, and then in this diagram, if it were to stop right here, this would be the one with the highest energy. Now notice that p orbitals have three boxes. So s orbitals can only hold two electrons uh, total, right? So that means that one box is sufficient to represent them. Uh, but p orbitals can hold six electrons. So we need three boxes to represent two p orbitals. Uh, or p orbitals, sorry, it doesn't matter if it's 2p, 3p, 4p, etc. And then think about that, right? What about d orbitals? How many can we hold total in a d in d orbitals? We can hold 10. So we would need five boxes if we were to continue that, you know? And then picture f orbitals. You need, you know, you can fit 14, so you'd need seven boxes to fit that. But you'll never really see f orbitals. So there is a pattern to how you put these arrows in there, but for now you really don't need to know the pattern. I just wanted to make sure that you guys were okay with the three basics to start with. What are the rules though? Okay, now we actually have to go into the details of the rules. The first rule is called the off bar principle. So the off bar principle says that these arrows or electrons are always added from the lowest energy to the highest energy. And the reason why is kind of complicated, but I like to think of it like this. Electrons are lazy. They don't not they don't want to waste energy if they don't have to waste energy. And since they don't want to waste energy, the off bar principle says they always start from the lowest energy. So what does that mean? If we're looking at our nice little boxes, 1s is the lowest energy. 3p is the highest energy. So the electrons are going to start added uh, start getting added, sorry, to the 1s. Then, after that's full, it'll move to the 2s. Then, it'll move to the 2p, and it'll continue, okay? So, for example, here is an incorrect orbital diagram for aluminum, and it asks, what is wrong with the above diagram? Be specific. It's kind of obvious. You can't just skip the 1s orbital. You have to fill them in sequentially going across. So this is definitely incorrect because you can never have like, you know, an empty orbital early in your orbital diagram. Next up, we have the uh, famous Hund's rule named after a scientist named, yes, you guessed it, Dr. Hund. So electrons must be added to separate orbitals of equal energy before moving on to higher energy orbitals. What that means is you have to kind of picture it like this. Electrons are lazy, but electrons like their space. So I like to think about it like if you were on a bus or something, okay? So let's say this, right? Let's say you're in a bus and there are only two seats. You walk, the first person walks in, they have to take that seat. Next person walks in, they have to sit next to them. Simple as that, right? Uh, let's say the next bus also has the same seating arrangement here. So, well, one person, two people. Now, what if that bus had three available rows of seats, okay? And these are all strangers on this bus, okay? The first person's gonna sit here. And then is the next person gonna sit next to them? That would be kind of weird, especially if you're a stranger. So no, the next person would sit in the next row. And then the next person that walks in, where are they gonna sit if they're strangers? They're gonna sit in, you know, the next empty row. And then, and only then, will you fill in the rest of it, okay? So that's what Hun's rule is all about. It's about filling things in, uh, in separate orbitals before you move on and start pairing everything up, okay? 
Now take a look at these diagrams. We have A, B, C, and we have D. Which one of them violates Hun's rule? C, A, B, C, or D, which one do you think? C, notice the P orbital here, the 2P, you can't have a paired, um, I guess you call them a pair of electrons, in the same state like this, you'd have to spread them out just like these ones are all spread out. Now that doesn't mean the rest of these are like, you know, perfect, but this is the only one here that violates Hun's rule. All right, last one, Pauli exclusion principle. So the Pauli exclusion principle says that electrons must have opposite spins. That means that up arrows and down arrows have to be present in each box. Um, you can't have two up arrows or two down arrows in the same box because up arrow and down arrow, those are the different spins technically that the electrons have. So if we're looking at this again, let's see, which one of these violates the Pauli exclusion principle? A, B, C, or D? Pretty obvious, right? B. Can't have two up arrows. Now, also, one of these just doesn't follow the off bop principle from before. Can you circle the off bop principle violation? It is right here. See, you can't have this unfilled and then move on. Remember, each energy level has to be filled up before you move on to the next one. All right, now, another little fact if you count the number of arrows, then that will tell you how many electrons something has. And so, if you know the number of electrons, that will tell you the element. For example, this is the orbital diagram for phosphorus. Count how many arrows there are. Looks like there are 15. So if I add those up, 2, 2, 6, 2, and 3, 15, the atomic number of phosphorus is 15. So even if I didn't know this was phosphorus, if I was looking at it, I'd be able to tell, oh, that's phosphorus just by looking at the orbital diagram. Let's draw a couple here, right? So I have carbon. So try drawing the orbital diagram for carbon. Look up carbon's atomic number, how many electrons it should have, and then figure that out. Should have looked like this. Ta -da. If you don't know how that works, here's how it works, right? You gotta fill that in one at a time. One, two, three, four, five, and then remember, you can't pair it up because two p orbitals, you have three boxes, so six. There's six electrons in carbon, its atomic number is six. What about chlorine? Try drawing chlorines and find it on your periodic table. Chlorine would look like this. So how would we fill it in? Let's make sure we're following our rules here, right? So let's follow our rules. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Notice they're all spread out. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Notice again, all spread out. 16 and 17, chlorine is number 17. Well, that's the end of this lesson, so if you have any questions, let me know.